Well, good evening and welcome to our Deeper Wednesday Bible Study. We're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. For those of you who are here in person and also those of you who are watching online, this is a time when our church family comes together and we dive deeper into God's Word because we believe that God is still speaking and He is speaking to us through the Bible. And so, as is our practice, we're going to open up in a time of prayer and we're going to ask that the Lord's presence be with us. Because at the end of the day, we must remember that God is a God who is moving and he is active in our lives. And he is doing things. He's making miracles happen. He's blessing us in ways that sometimes we recognize. He's also blessing us in ways that maybe we overlook. But as we begin to dive into the word this evening, I just want to go before the Lord because I believe that he can and he will do a miracle in your life. God is working in our lives. He's working in our midst. And we want to welcome him into everything that we're doing. So why don't we just take a moment and go before the Lord in quiet reverence. God, first of all, we come before you with hearts of adoration. Lord, we come with our hands lifted high and we worship you, God. We worship you because you are a good God. We worship you because you are holy. God, we worship you because you deserve all the glory and all the honor. Lord, we worship you because you're the one who created everything that is. God, we worship you because you're the one that continues to push life into our world and into our universe. God, we worship you because you are worthy. There's no one like you. There's no one as righteous as you. There's no one as just as you. And Lord, we thank you that you are moving in our midst. That God, from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, your name is to be praised, God. God, we love you this evening because you are the God of truth. You speak into our lives and you guide us down paths of righteousness. God, you call us up higher. God, you call us to be who you have called us to be. Lord, you are the God of truth, and nothing can stand against your truth, God. Lord, your statutes are like rocks deeply planted into the ground, God. There's nothing that can take down your word, and there's nothing that can overcome your word. So, Lord, we thank you that you are the God of truth, and we worship you in spirit and truth this evening. You also are the God of wisdom. Lord, thank you for being the the one who has given us minds and our rationality, God, so that we can think about our world, but more importantly, think about you. Lord, we thank you that you are the one who speaks things into our hearts. God, you guide our paths when we're not certain what to do. Lord, when we're in a dark place, you are the light that guides us along the way. Lord, we worship you because you're the God of beauty. Lord, you've placed us here in this universe and in this world where everything is perfectly set up for us. Lord, we're just far enough away from the sun. We're just close enough that, Lord, life can thrive here in this world. Lord, we thank you for all the life that is in the earth, God. Everything that you've given to us, Lord, so that we can live and so that we can serve you, Lord, and steward your world. God, we thank you for the beauty and the creativity that we join in, God, the different ways that we express you. God, I, God, I pray that we would use the different ways that we're creative to worship you, God, to honor you, and to celebrate your goodness. And Lord, we worship you because you are the God of justice. We know that you are a liberator for the oppressed. We know that you are the peacemaker in the midst of war. We know that you are the God makes the crooked paths straight. And so God, we join the elders around the throne this evening. And we say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. God, we also come before you realizing that without you, we'd be like a ship without a sail. God, we would be totally lost without you. In fact, God, when we try to do things our own way, we often mess things up really, really bad. God, we thank you that in the midst of our brokenness, you put us back together. 
when we're lost, you find us. When we're in a dark place, you find us. And so, Lord, even though we are a broken people, we also know that we are a people who have been put back together and made whole in Jesus' name. Lord, we confess those ways in which we depart from your ways. God, we, we, we cast before you those evil thoughts that we have and those struggles that we have. And Lord, we thank you that you have already forgiven us. That, God, you don't count our sins against us. That, God, you forgive us so that we can experience freedom to serve you. Lord, we also come before you as a thankful people this evening. God, we say thank you for guiding us. Lord, thank you for everything that you've brought into our lives to lead us along the way that you desire us to be. Thank you for the people who give us advice. God, thank you for the different situations that you've created to guide us onto the path that you've intended for us. Lord, thank you for guiding us better than we guide ourselves. Lord, we also thank you for being the God who speaks truth in our lives. Thank you for revealing to us who we should be. God, thank you for reminding us that we are made for more. That, God, we are more than conquerors, God, in your son's name. That, Lord, we are made with a divine purpose. That, God, we're not just called to live in this world and do whatever, but, God, you have a special calling upon each of us. And, Lord, thank you for being the God who calls us into your purpose. Lord, thank you that at the end of the day, we don't have to try to figure out how best to serve you, God. Lord, you make that clear to us. God, we also thank you for creation. Lord, thank you for giving us everything that we need to live, for putting food on our table, for giving us a community of people who love us, who see the best in us. God, thank you for putting us here in this world at this time, God, so that we can be a light in a dark place. Lord, we thank you that even though our world is broken, you are not done with us yet. And finally, we thank you that you are a God of justice. That, Lord, in a world where there's war, where there's crime, where people experience deep heartaches, where people experience breakups and the ending of relationships and the loss of children and loved ones, Lord, we thank you that you are the God of justice and that as you break into our world, and Lord, as you set things right, there will be a holy justice that encompasses the entire earth, God. And God, finally, we take a moment and we come before you with supplication. God, we are a people who have needs, and we know that even before we pray about these needs, you, need, you know about them, God. God, I pray for every person who is sick in their mind or body that you would heal them in Jesus' name. God, that you would bring medical professionals into their lives to help them be, get better. But, Lord, that you would also do the miraculous. That, God, people would show up at doctor's appointments and they would get an unexpected good report. That, Lord, that person who's been struggling with depression, all of a sudden they would have joy that is unspeakable and that they cannot contain. Lord, we pray for healing in Jesus' name. God, we pray that not only would you heal bodies, God, we pray that you would heal communities. God, we pray that you would heal Barto. God, where there's been division, we pray that you would bring people together. God, we pray that you would heal this nation. God, where there's been division over race, class, and politics, that, Lord, you would unite people across the spectrum. God, we pray that you would heal our world, that there would be an end to war, that, Lord, the innocent would no longer be caught in harm's way. We pray for healing all around in Jesus' name. God, we also pray that you would provide for each of our needs. Lord, for those who are looking for housing, God, I pray that you would open up places for them to be. That, God, you would uh, provide them with the jobs and the work so that they can pay rent. God, I pray for that person who is struggling uh, to make ends meet. That, God, you would drop unexpected paychecks. That, God, that they would have a unexpected bonus in their check, God. Lord, that you would send somebody their way to provide food or to provide what they need, God. Lord, I pray for every single need in this community. God, I pray for the single mother. God, I pray for the single father. Lord, I pray for the person who feels like they're all alone. 
God, I pray for every single person who is broken this evening. God, that you would move in power and that you would show up in their lives and that you would provide for every one of their needs. And finally, God, we pray for this church. God, I pray that you would do the miraculous here at New Beginnings Church, not because of a pastor, but because of the shepherd who is Jesus Christ, the Lord of this church, the person who owns this church, God. God, I pray that you would bring lost souls into this church. Lord, I pray that people would experience deliverance in this church. God, I pray that you would overflow us into the altars. That, God, there would be such a movement of your spirit. Lord, that it wouldn't just start with the adults, but, Lord, it would start with the youth. That, Lord, you would shake us. That you would revive us once again. That, God, you would start something here that would spread like wildfire throughout our town. And that, Lord, when people look into Central Florida and they see Polk County, God, they would see a beacon of hope and they would see your name lifted up. So, God, as we continue on in this Bible study, I pray that you would be present here. God, that you would help us understand your word more and that, God, as a result of what we would hear, Lord, what we would do would be different. Would be different. God, how we live would be different, that we'd be a transformed people. We pray all these things in your name. All righty, so we are going to jump right into the Word this evening. As you know, we started two weeks ago a Bible study on the Declaration of Faith. One of the things that, as I was planning for this new year, in terms of what we would be doing on Sunday morning in our message series, and then what we'd be doing in Wednesday night Bible study, one of the things that really kept coming to mind is it was important for us to really understand what we as a church family believe. So New Beginnings Church is a part of the Church of God family of churches, which is a global denomination. And so we have sister churches all over the globe. One of the things that I think is helpful is that when you're a part of a family is to know what your family values are, know what your family uh, beliefs are in this case. What is it that we believe? How is it that we as a Church of God congregation here at New Beginnings Church, how is it that we see the world? How is it that we understand what God is doing in the world? So the way that the Church of God has summarized what it, what it believes and what is at the center of how it, believe, how it looks at the world and how it understands life is the declaration of faith. It's the Church of God's set of beliefs that explains what we believe. So last week we looked at Article 1, which talks about the fact that in the church God, we believe that the Bible is God's inspired word to us, uh, that every single thing that is in the Bible, God meant to be there. And it is not just there for the original audience that lived thousands of years ago, but it's also there for you and I. And so part of the reason that we gather to hear the preach word, or we come to a Bible study, or we study the word of God on our own, is because we believe that God is still speaking to us through the scripture. We also believe that when there's a question out there about anything, about how we use our money, about how we do things like voting, how we deal with things like war, we we turn our eyes to the Bible, trusting that the Lord will speak to us and give us guidance on how we encounter these very critical issues that you and I face. Well, today we are going to be looking at Article 2 of the Declaration of Faith that deals with what I'm calling tonight the centerpiece of our our beliefs and our faith. So we're going to listen or watch a quick video on the Declaration of Faith, and then we're going to jump right into the Bible study. The Declaration of Faith. 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 The Church of God believes the whole Bible to be completely and equally inspired and that it is the written Word of God. The Church of God has adopted the following Declaration of Faith as its standard and official expression of its doctrine. We believe in the verbal inspiration of the Bible. In one God eternally existing in three persons, namely the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. That Jesus Christ is the only begotten Son of the Father. Conceived of the Holy Ghost. And born of the Virgin Mary. That Jesus was crucified, 
buried and raised from the dead, that he ascended to heaven and is today at the right hand of the Father as the intercessor. That all have sinned and come short of the glory of God and that repentance is commanded of God for all. And necessary for forgiveness of sins. That justification, regeneration, and the new birth are wrought by faith in the blood of Jesus Christ. In sanctification, subsequent to the new birth, through faith in the blood of Christ, through the Word, and by the Holy Ghost. Holiness to be God's standard of living for His people. In the baptism with the Holy Ghost. Subsequent to a clean heart. In speaking with other tongues as the Spirit gives utterance. And that it is the initial evidence of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. In water baptism by immersion. And all who repent should be baptized. In the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Divine healing is provided for all in the atonement. In the Lord's Supper and washing of the saints' feet. In the premillennial second coming of Jesus. First, to resurrect the righteous, dead, and to catch away the living saints to Him in the air. Second, to reign on the earth a thousand years. In the bodily resurrection. Eternal life for the righteous. And eternal punishment for the wicked. All right, so um, I want to use an illustration as a way into uh, what we're going to be discussing this evening. So when I was a little kid, we lived in Linwood, Illinois, which was a suburb of Chicago, Illinois. So the city was just a matter of minutes away. One of the favorite things that I enjoyed about the city as a little kid was when you would be driving uh, north up into the city, you would begin to see the skyscrapers that line Lake Michigan for what seemed to be miles and miles. And I loved, as a little kid, looking at the skyscrapers because at the time, one of the tallest buildings in the world, the Sears Tower, was there. Now, you might wonder how is it that engineers are able to build such, such tall buildings that, number one, don't fall down, uh, but stay strong and are able to be built that tall. Well, it's a simple engineering thing. The, the reason that engineers are able to build skyscrapers and other tall buildings is that they have a strong internal structure that's composed of a number of different things. So steel beams, concrete, rebar, all of these things are engineered together to hold this massive tall building together. That's why sk skyscrapers can be so tall and they don't fall down. In a similar fashion, we can think about God as the internal structure of everything that is here in our world. God is what holds everything together. In fact, the Bible tells us that every part of our existence is held together by someone rather than something that gives the world life, order, and purpose. And the Bible calls the one who holds everything together God. God is the thing, the person that holds all things together. God is the one who from all li that all life in the universe comes from. God is the one who creates harmony uh, in a, such a complex universe, and he brings everything together. The Bible says that at the end of the day, everything that is here in the world, everything in the universe is held together and is created by God. So when we say God in, in our church, what we are referring to is the person, the being, the spirit that holds everything together. We are referring to the person who created the heavens and the earth. We're also talking about the person who is interested in you and I as people. We're, we're talking about the person who knows our purpose individually. Even though God is big, and the Bible makes that very clear, God, God is big. God is, in fact, so big, God has no limits. Even in all of God's largeness, that big God has a desire to know you personally, which I think is just a really significant thing that we need to understand, is that the one who created the universe, the one who's responsible for all life in the universe, the one who holds everything together, is also the same God that's holding you together. So the thing that I want us to look at is the second article of the Declaration of Faith in the Church of God, and it simply says this. This is what we as a church believe about God. We believe in one God eternally existing in three persons, namely the Father, 
Son, and Holy Ghost. Let me read that again. We believe in one God, eternally existing in three persons, namely the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. So here's what I want us to catch as we begin to dig into what exactly this article of faith means. Um, I want us to understand that the second article of the Declaration of Faith is a proclamation that we believe that there is one God who is at the center of our existence. Importantly, in our church, we don't believe in that there are other gods. We believe that there is only one God. Uh, there's only one thing at the center of our existence. Now, uh, you might automatically think about when, when we say something like that, that we're saying that we don't believe in the God that the Muslims w worship, or we don't believe in the God that the Buddhists worship. That's partly what we're saying, but I would also extend it to mean that we don't believe that there are other things that can rule our life. Uh, sometimes our money and our finances can become like a God. It controls everything that we do. Sometimes people can become our God, and they kind of control and dictate everything that we do. But maybe we can dig a bit deeper. Sometimes we can be the God of our own lives because we think that we are in control of everything, and we don't need anybody, including a God who's somewhere out there. In our church, we believe that there is one God who is at the center of our existence. We don't believe that there are other gods who should f fill that space. This also means that uniquely, we believe that God exists in a community of three persons, Father, Son, and Spirit. Now, we're going to dig a little bit more into this, and um, some of you know that by day, I am a theologian at a university, and I've spent hours trying to understand this fully. This is one of the more mysterious, challenging parts of the Christian faith. We believe in one God, but we believe that that God exists in three persons. We don't believe that there are three gods, but we believe that there is one God who exists united in three persons. So that's often called the doctrine or the teaching of the Trinity. It is one of the things that makes the Christian view of God very unique. The idea that God is one God existing in three persons. But we're going to dig a little bit more into that in a minute. So I want us just to take a few minutes to dig further into this second article of the Declaration of Faith, mainly because it sets the tone for everything else that's going to be said. What we say we believe about God, it should structure everything else that we believe what we believe about others, what we believe about our world, what we believe about our purpose, what we say about God is in many respects the lens through which we look at everything else. What we believe about God should shape how we live. What we believe about God should shape the type of people that we are. So let's go ahead and dig into that first part of this, this article of our faith. The idea that we believe in one God. So our church believes that God is the creator of all things, even though he is uncreated. So we believe that the trees, the animals, the bass that I caught in the lake the other day, I'm joking, I haven't caught anything lately when I've gone fishing, but we believe that everything in the world and everything in the universe, the stars, the planets, the comets, we believe that God created all those things. However, we believe that God is uncreated. We believe that God has always just been. There never was a point when God didn't exist, which when I try to think about that, that causes my head to hurt sometimes because uh, I have a newborn child, uh, Shiloh. He has a definite time at which he came into the world. He was born on November 16th. God doesn't have a birth date. God has always been, but God is the one who has birthed everything that is in the universe. So we believe that God is the creator of all things, even though he is uncreated. We also believe that God is the sustainer of all things, even though he never grows weary. What does that mean? We believe that all the life that is flowing through the universe, uh, that, that comes from God. The Bible tells us that God breathed life into a formless earth. Uh, the breath that you and I have, uh, that we believe that that comes from God. We believe that all life, all, all the thriving things that we see in the universe, we believe that the abundance of life that we see everywhere, it comes from God. And here's the crazy thing about God. God always has more life to give. God doesn't get tired. 
God doesn't get tired of giving life. God doesn't get tired of loving his creation. God is the giver of life, and he continues to give and give. He didn't just create the world and step back, but God continues to give life into the world. Finally, we believe that God is the perfecter of all things, even though he himself is perfect. What does that mean? We believe that God can take things that are broken and put them back together, even though God does not need to be put back together. God is not broken. God doesn't have struggles like you and I, but he knows how to put us back together. That's why the Bible tells us that even though the world is full of sin, the different ways we depart from how God has called us to be, we are told that God is not afraid of that. In fact, God knows exactly what to do. That's why we can call God the perfecter of all things. So we believe in one God who is creator, who is the sustainer of life, and who is the perfecter of all things. We must understand that God is at the center of our existence. This means that without him, nothing would be. If for some reason we could somehow take God out of the picture, everything that we see around us, including us, would simply just cease to be. God is the foundation on which the rest of everything that exists is built. So we must understand that God is the center of our existence, and without him, nothing would be. Now, I want to say this, um, and this is where we can kind of begin to practically apply this idea that God is at the center of our existence. While you and I can try to put other things at the center of our lives and let other things take the place of God, we will find that none of them compare to God. You know, we can spend a lot of time serving other gods in our life. Um, I've already highlighted money, people, ourselves. Um, Maybe your God is your job and the reputation that you've built. Maybe your God is a sport. Uh, Maybe your God is video games. There's a lot of different things we can allow to control us. There's a lot of different things we can allow to be at the center of our lives and give us a sense of fulfillment. But here is the truth this evening. Only God can fill us. Only God can truly play that role. Only God can truly give us everything that we need. In uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 4 through 6, um, Paul gives us some helpful words on this idea that there is one God who's at the center of all things. So let's go ahead and turn there. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 4 through 6. Again, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 4 through 6. Here's what the word of God says. And again, that's uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 4 through 6. So then, about eating food sacrificed to idols, we know that an idol is nothing at all in the world and that there is no God but one. For even if there are other so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods, and many lords, yet for us there is but one God, the Father from whom all things came and for whom we live. And there is but one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. One of the things that we have to other understand is that the other things that we often let be God in our lives can never, ever compare to the God who is the creator of the of all. This is what Paul is saying. He's saying that these idols, these these other things that we make God, they are nothing compared to the one who created us. They are nothing compared to the Father. They pale in comparison. And then Paul even says, look, even if for some reason there are other gods somewhere out there, or other lords, or other things that try to play the role of God, they don't matter because at the end of the day, there is one Father from whom all things come, and that is God the Creator. So the first part of that is this idea that we we believe in one God. We don't believe in multiple gods. And again, that's not just other religions. That means we don't allow other things to take charge of our life. We don't allow other things to be at the center of our existence. But not only do we believe in one God, we believe in one God eternally existing. So let's break that down a little bit. In our church, we believe that God is an eternal being. 
meaning that he has no beginning and he has no end. Let me say that again. We believe that there is one God eternally existing. That means he has no beginning and he has no end. Now, again, this is one of the parts of our faith that that can kind of really begin to make your brain hurt after a while because there are two things that are very much guaranteed to you and I as human beings. One is that one day we're going to be born. We, we all, if we're here, we've been born. Can we agree? Uh, but we also will one day die. Those two things are guaranteed to us. We have a very definite beginning and we have a very definite end. But the Bible tells us that God does not have those things. God has always just been. Uh, God does not have a beginning and he does not have an end. So we, uh, a few, I think it was this past weekend, we sung a song about God being the Alpha and the Omega. Uh, sometimes in the church we'll refer to God as the Alpha and the Omega in our prayer. What we are saying in affirming is this idea that God has no beginning and he has no end. What we're saying is that God was there at the beginning of our lives because he already was. And God will be there at the end of our lives because he always has been. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the first and the last. He is the bookends of all existence. We must understand that God has always existed. Not only that, but God has always been who God has been. What does that mean, Pastor? It means that God has always been holy. Uh, Sister Purdue, I thank God that there wasn't a point at which God matured and grew up a little bit and started behaving. The Bible tells us that God has always been good and God will always be good. For you and I, that means that when we pray to God, we don't have to worry that at some point God is going to get tired of us and no longer be good to us. God is always going to be good because that is who God is. Uh, God is also always righteous. What God does it is is right. Uh, it, it causes life to happen. It is holy. It is in line with who God is. Uh, again, there's not a point in the future where God is going to kind of get bored with being righteous and he's like, you know, I'm going to go do some evil things. God is always righteous. It is just a part of who he is. Uh, God is always righteous. Uh, but God is also all powerful. What does that mean? It means that God can do anything that God desires to do. God is all powerful. Uh, this is why when we talk about uh, the, the battles that God fights on our behalf, God's not worried about losing to Satan. Uh, there's not a point at which God is going to get overwhelmed. God is all powerful. There's nothing that's going to take him out. God is undefeated. Amen, D? God is undefeated. God is all-powerful. God is also all-knowing, which means he, he knows. Now, this is another part of our teaching about God that can make your head hurt sometimes. God knows what you're going to do before you do it. Uh, God understands why things happen. Um, God sees a picture that you and I don't have. Uh, I kind of like to think of it like this. I remember before I ever got on a plane, um, thinking that most of what was out there consisted of our street in Linwood, Illinois, and where my school was. I thought our little town was mostly all there was to the world. And I remember, Deep, the first time that we got on a plane and we took off from Chicago O'Hare Airport, and I remember being up above the city and seeing everything in the city that I had never seen before. And then being able to look all the way out west and just see the land go on forever. And I realized that my perspective was quite limited because I had been on the ground. My perspective changed being up in that plane. God has a different perspective on things. God, God is all-knowing because God can see things that you and I cannot. He has his eye on everything. Uh, so let's go ahead and turn to Psalm 92. Psalm 92. Psalm 92. So Psalm 92, um, let me clarify, Psalm book 90, and then we're going to look at verse 2 in Psalm 90. So turn to Psalm 90, and we're going to look at verse 2. So Psalm 90, and then we'll look at verse 2. 
So it says this. Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Let me read that again. Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. So what is, what is that trying to say there? One of the things that we know about our mountains and our earth is that it is very, very old. Uh, geologists, they, they study these things all the time. In fact, when we lived in Colorado, we got to go out to the mountains and learn about how those were made when the different uh, continental plates crashed together and over millions and millions of years, uh, they ended up becoming a mountain. The mountains are very old. But what the Bible is saying is that God is even older than the mountains. God, God, God has always been God before even those things that we consider to be ancient and prehistoric, so to speak, God has always been God. What does that mean? It means that this is why we can call him Alpha and Omega. He's the ancient of days. He's always been there, and he always will be. Before anything in this world, God has always been God, which means that God will always be God over your life. He'll always be God in your situations. He is the ancient of days. He's the one who's the first and the last. So we believe in one God, who's eternally existing. And finally, we believe that this one God who's eternally existing uh, exists in three persons, namely the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Let me read that again. We believe that God is God in three persons, namely the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. So like I said, this tends to be one of the parts of of our our belief system that can be very confusing for people. Um, In fact, in our neck of the woods of Christianity and Pentecostalism, some churches don't necessarily believe in this teaching called the Trinity. Uh, We are a Trinitarian Pentecostal church, which means we believe that God is God in three persons. We, We believe that. So let me give a couple things that maybe will help us dig into this, because I actually think that this is a very important part of our faith. We don't believe in three gods. This would lead to some sort of polytheism, the idea that there are many gods out there. In fact, the the early Christians were accused of being polytheists because they were talking about Father, Son, and Spirit. You and I, we believe in one God. We don't believe in multiple gods. We believe in one God who exists in a community of persons. One way that this has been described um, is it's kind of like a circle dance. So let's say on Sunday morning we were to clear out all the chairs and we were to all join hands and dance in a circle for church. I'm not suggesting that we would do that. Both our church clerk and one of our deacons are looking at me like, Pastor, please, that's not a good idea. We're not going to do that. But let's say we all join hands and danced in a circle. We would all be our individual selves, but we're dancing in unison. We have to know what the other person is doing. That's a helpful way of thinking of what it means for God to exist in three persons. Father, Son, and Spirit, they are distinct, yet they are united. So um, I think that here's a helpful way of maybe thinking about what we're talking about. So here we got, what, what, what shape is this up here? It's a triangle. You get an A+. Plus. That's my, my 16-year-old. All right, all right. So um, we, we, when we call God Father... We are saying that God is, uh, we're, we're, we're calling God Father, we're saying that he's the creator. He's the one from whom all things start. So when we talk about God the Father, uh, we are talking about God the parent, God the creator. Uh, but in order for God to be a father, God would have to have a what? God would have to have a child, right? So we believe that God also exists as son, uh, that God the Father has a son. His name is Jesus Christ. But we also believe that God exists as spirit. Um, So we believe in God, the Holy Spirit. Um, In fact, in our church, in the Pentecostal church, we talk quite a bit about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God's power. It's God's life that is moving through our midst in our world. So you see here that we have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
the father is is not the son, but the father is connected to the son. Uh, we have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not the Father or the Son, but it, but is connected to the Father and the Son. They have different roles. They have different ways in which we describe what they're doing in our lives, but they are united together as they work. When we experience the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, we experience the presence of God the Father. We experience the, the presence of the Son. When we experience being saved by Jesus Christ, we experience the resurrection power of the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, who was sent by the Father. When we, when we celebrate God and his creation, we know that the word that was with God in the beginning that created the world was the Son. And the Bible tells us that in the beginning, God's spirit was brooding over the waters. You see, when we experience God, we experience the fullness of God. We experience Father, Son, and Spirit all at once. You never can experience one of these alone. That's why we can say we worship one God in three persons. To experience the Father is to experience the presence of his Son who saves and the power of the Holy Ghost. To experience the salvation of Jesus Christ is to experience the Father who loves us and the Spirit of God who can resurrect us unto new life. To experience the Spirit of God moving in our lives and gifting us is to experience the Father who through the power of the Spirit and the presence of the Son created the world. So again, it's important to understand we're not talking about three different gods, but we're talking about a community of persons who are joined together, who are living in an eternal community. They're God. So why is this significant? this idea that we believe in God eternally existing in three persons, namely the Father, Son, and Spirit. That, that sounds great, but what does that have to do with you and I? I have three thoughts. The first thing is, is that I think you and I are called to recognize that we are also called to live in community just as God lives in community as Father, Son, and Spirit. Part of the reason you and I are made for each other, we're made to live in community, we're not meant to be alone, is because God's not alone. Father, Son, and Spirit, they exist in a community together. They love each other's company. They wouldn't think of life without each other. You and I are also called to live in community just as God is community himself. Community is not just with God, but it's also with others. Second thing is this, I think that when we think about this idea that God exists in community, I think that it should hopefully real, help us realize that God is calling us into community with him and with others. And finally, I think that when we think about this teaching, we can remember that God is calling us to live in community with others as we are in relationship with God who exists in community with Father, Son, and Spirit. How is it that this teaching that we believe in God eternally existing in three persons applicable to you and I? I think when we gather together as a church family, we are affirming this idea that God has called us to community. Uh, there are different parts to our community. Not, not everyone is the deacon. Not everyone is a wonderful vocalist like Sister Purdue. Not everyone is doing children's ministry like Sister Tatiana. We all have a different part, but we come together in order to be the church. We're called to do life together. And so I think that as we are thinking about how this teaching applies to our lives, I think that when we look at God, who is Father, Son, and Spirit, it should remind us and be a call to us that we are called to be in community with one another. We're not called to do life alone. We're certainly not called to do our Christian faith alone, but we need each other. Amen? Amen. So that's Article 2 of our, of our Declaration of Faith. We're going to be going into uh, Article 3 next week, uh, which gets into some of how we understand God moving in our world. So we've said that God eternally exists as three persons. What does God actually have to do with you and I? How does God enter into our lives? The third article of our faith talks about that. Well, we're going to go ahead and pray and close out this evening. I'll remind you that we have church every Sunday at 10.30 a.m. We would love to see you. We are wanting to grow, and so we'd love to see you here.
1030 every Sunday, and we also have Bible study every Wednesday night at 630 p.m. But let's go before the Lord and close out this evening. God, we thank you for this opportunity to gather in your name. We thank you for your goodness, for bringing everyone here this evening. We thank you for those who are watching online. God, I pray that as we understand who you are and that you are a, a God who exists in community, God, I pray that we would enjoy greater levels of community ourselves. Lord, that we would value our church family. That, Lord, we'd recognize that we are made to be in relationship with one another. That, Lord, we're there, called to be there to support one another, encourage one another. Lord, that we would be drawn together and that, God, as we're drawn together, we would be stronger because of it. God, that we wouldn't just be stronger as individuals, but, Lord, we'd be stronger as a faith community together. God, I pray that you would be uh, at work in every need represented by the people here. Lord, that you would work in those needs that are clear and work in those needs that maybe we haven't told anybody. God, I pray that you would take everyone safely home this evening. We pray all these things in your name. Amen. Amen. We will see you next week. God bless you and have a wonderful evening.